but I have a YouTube channel and a blog called Sean's Allotment Garden. And it's basically what I get up to on my plot every week. For the first, oh, I've been doing it about 12 years now. When I first started doing it, there were only three of us in the country. There was me and uh, somebody in the north and somebody in the south. And uh, it was just us. But now it seems to be that if you take on a plot, you have to set up a channel. Because there are so many YouTube channels out there now of people filming on their plots. Some are good, and but the majority of them are quite bad because people tend to uh, forget that when you film, especially on your phone, and I'm trying to see if I can find my phone, uh, when people film on their phone, they tend to do it rather quickly. And that on the video comes out as being far too fast. So if you ever do film uh, the garden, you have to go really, really slowly, unnaturally slowly. And then that comes out quite good. So I started about, yeah, about 12 years ago, I think it was. And uh, mainly because I was forgetting where I was putting things in the garden. I have a health condition called ME, which is chronic fatigue syndrome. And I go through bouts of where it's quite good. And then for about a month or two, two where it's quite bad. And one of the side effects is you go into this brain fog. So we can have this conversation now. And in, a, and in about an hour, I'll probably forget the entire conversation. Um, so I started to film myself in the garden just because I was forgetting where things were being put and especially with labels. So you put the label in the ground, come back the next day and the fox has decided to pull all the labels up or a friend brought their child over to the garden once and he had great delight in presenting me with all the labels he had collected throughout the garden. So I had the video to go back and I could see where things had been put. Um, so that was the main reason why I started to do it. And because I work in TV as well, I started in TV about 30, uh, yeah, about 13. I was on Songs of Praise. And I was fascinated by the fact that I was singing in the afternoon, but we were pretending it was the morning. Then the lights blew up, so we had to do it all over again. And I lived ne next door to a guy in South Wales who was a world champion chrysanthemum and leek grower. So he was always on TV every few months. So I'd go into the garden and uh, they'd be there filming. So I was fascinated by how they were doing it. Although he, he still doesn't know to this day that I sprayed my apple trees. And that's why all his chrysanthemum died this particular year. Cause I'd, sp I'd sprayed them with I got my weed killer and my feed watering cans mixed up one day. And uh, yeah, he still doesn't know to this day. So I've always had an interest in TV. And then I moved to Cardiff to pursue a TV career. My career took me into films. So I did a few, fe I did a few feature films. So I, so I said, right, I'll go into films. Then my career took me into TV, so I did a few TV shows. Um, and then I wanted to come to London because that's where the TV industry is. And I came when I was about 21. And I lived by the BT Tower and I lasted about a week. Because coming from a small village in South Wales, it was just it was just a bit too much. So I went back home and I came up with this plan that I was going to live in Cardiff for three or four years then go to Manchester and then go down to London. So getting used to cities as they got bigger. And then when I reached 30, I decided to go to university, mainly because in TV that there's this thing that if you, if you've, you haven't been to university, you can, you can only earn a certain amount. But if you go to university, your top amount Without a, without, a uh, without a university education becomes your minimum. Um, so I found it quite boring when I went to Manchester just because I was self-taught and they were just going over the same things. But I just kept on thinking about the money at the end of it. And I put my name down for an allotment site in Manchester and it took about four and a half years to get back to me. 
So by the time I had a plot, I, I was already in London. But while I was in Manchester, I worked on a question of sport, Coronation Street. Um, oh, Tonight with Trevor McDonald's. Um, loads of uh, TV shows. So this is why I say I haven't had the most conventional career. Because I started at Channel 4 as a researcher. And then within a year, was producing a TV show for them. And then three years after, went back to be a researcher. But when I came to London, I moved to London. I was packing my bags on the day the bomb went off. Uh, the bombs on the bus. And I can't remember the date of that. Was that about 16 years ago now? And uh, so, and the first thing I did was I put my name down for a plot. And they were like, right, well, it's going to take three or four years. Well, I wasn't having any of that. So I decided to go down to the allotment site and on the weekends I would help out. And once a month they would do a, a working party day. So I'd go and help with that. And within six months they said, right, well, we can see that you're keen. So we're going to give you a plot. That's why I don't think really think that there's an allotment shortage in the country. Because I worked out the other day that in 16 years I've probably had about 10 plots just because I've lived in areas and then I've moved to different areas. Um, so that's where it all started, filming myself because I didn't know where things were. And I did that constantly for about four and a half years, five years. And one of the advantages of being a vlogger is you get, op you get some opportunities uh, from it. I'm just gonna close my email because I can see them. Pop, I can see them popping up in the corner. And um, so some of the opportunities you get is you get books before they come out. So you, so you send a books to have, a, to have a, a read of. You get to see TV shows before they come out. And you also get to grow things before they come out. And I was sent a seed, which was a Brussels sprout crossed with a kale. And it was from Thomas and Morgan, I think it was which they then turned out two years after I grew this. It then turned out to be, um, I forget what they're called now. Flower sprouts. Yeah, they were called flower sprouts by Thomas de Morgan. But if you buy them in the supermarket, they're called flower sprouts. Oh, they're Kalex. Called Kalex. Kalex. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I grew that about two years before that came out. And then you offer feedback to the company and everything. So something I was sent last year, because companies like to mess around with things. Like the, the one vegetable I've turned down that I've been sent, because I didn't see the point of it, was a tomato plant that you could grow potatoes at the bottom. So you lift the potatoes, so you lift the tomato plant out at the end of the season, there's potatoes at the bottom in the soil, and there's tomatoes on top. And my feedback to Thompson and Morgan was, well, that's great, because if you have blight, it'll kill them both at the same time. Um, so I didn't actually bother to try that because I thought I was taking this sort of experiment thing a bit too far. But last year I was sent this, which is a winter squash, uh, an acorn squash. And they said that it tastes of mashed potato. So they've got two varieties out. Uh, and I think this came from, I think this could be Thompson and Morgan as well. One is called winter squash, uh, winter squash jacket potato, and the other one is winter squashed um, uh, mashed potato. So you grow it the same way as you grow your squash. But what's quite good about it is it doesn't spread. So the plant just stays in the same sort of uh, place. And I actually tried one the other day, and I'm keeping this one because I want to film it for my video that goes out on Wednesday. Um, but it's a very weird experience because it does actually taste of potato. And people have said to me, when you start to when you start to eat it, you just stop in the kitchen and it just plays with your head for a while. It's because it it tastes of potato that's been creamed, so like creamy potatoes. But I I've really fought I've really fallen for this, and I'm going to grow far more of this next year and actually maybe cut back on my potatoes. Um, so you can buy those seeds from Thompson and Morgan. And 
Yeah, so that's something that I approve of. And apparently these will be in the shops next September. Uh, so that's something you can go and have a go of. Now, I've got some videos lined up. So I thought maybe we'll just have a quick look at some of the stuff that I do. So now we're going to show you an example of the vlog that I do, which currently goes out every week, but starting in October, I'm going to try and aim for three of them each week. So if we can just play that. Hello, welcome back to a very windy allotment where a lot is going to happen today. If you're new to this channel, give it a thumbs up and click subscribe and the bell icon. Right, let's crack on. So now that the hot weather has cooled down a lot, I'm prepared to put my onions and shallots in. And this year I'm growing onion set radar, onion set red cross, I've done these before, they're great. And shallot red sun and shallot golden gourmet. So, like I say, it's going to be a busy day on the allotment today. If you're planting anything at this time of year, sowing anything, tell me in the comments below. Right, let's get on. Now, cabbages, cauliflowers, like a firm bottom. And because this is fresh, freshly planted soil, I'm just gonna go over it with a odd bit of wood and just firm it down. Because if they don't have a firm bottom, there's a likelihood that they will blow and not give a very good crop. So the first thing I'm planting is cabbage called Advantage. And I got these from DT Brown. Nice healthy looking plants there are too. Pop it in. Now when you do cabbages and collies and things like this, you can plant them a bit deeper, up to the first leaf. So I do it like that and then as you force it down to give it a nice firm bottom, it then naturally sinks down. Like so. And then we move on to the next one. That's just a quick example of the stuff that I do. Um, what's quite interesting is you can't sort of second guess what's going to be popular with the viewers. And I've done something over the last month, which was just an, was just an idea that I saw. And that was writing on the side of the raised beds. So the black you see is actually black that is used for chalkboard. And if you use liquid pen, you can then write on the wood and it will stay there it doesn't matter if it rains all day and I had this idea because I was on the bus one day and I just happened to look outside and there was a pub and I started thinking why do they how do they keep the writing to stay on the boards whatever the weather so I just got off the bus I just I just went in and asked and uh, that is the latest popular thing that's on the internet in is on the internet at the moment I'm getting so many emails about I think that idea is great somebody's painted the side of their shed black so they can put all the jobs for the week up on the side and uh, so that they don't forget um, what tasks that they haven't done. Another um, 
advantage from doing uh, the blog is you get invited to all the shows and everything. And I've been given uh, exclusive access to Kew Gardens ones where I could go, where I could just go in and film whatever I wanted to do. And then from out of the from out of the blue, I had this phone call saying, "Would you like to come in for a job interview? We're launching a new gardening website, but we can't tell you what the name of the company is." So my friend at the time, she was about to leave The Guardian and I had written a column for the, for the Guardian in the previous 12 month. So I just assumed I was going for a job with The Guardian. So it wasn't until the first day that I started that I found out that I was working for Daily Mail. And apparently the reason why they didn't tell me was because they'd had so many people that had turned the job down just because it was the Daily Mail. But I was like, well, it's the gardening section. So, you know, how much how much trouble am I going to get into? So I did that for about a year. And one of my members of staff was Monty Don. So I would speak to Monty every Monday and talk to him about his column and what he was going to write for us. And he was quite surprised on one particular day that I knew something about gardening and that I knew that his article was regurgitating what had been in Gardener's World on the Friday night. Uh, so we decided to do columns that didn't have a conflict because obviously we weren't going to pay for something that had already been put out into the public. So he started talking about the animals in his garden. Um, but it, unfor unfortunately, all that work for the website and all his articles and everything was destroyed uh, the Daily Mail are going through this process where everything will be on the internet within the next five years. So my website was a proof of concept, they call it. So it was just to prove whether people would buy things from a website. Um, that's how I know that uh, uh, that a rattan furniture is a very popular product. If we ever had a week where we had to present the figures to the boss and they weren't that good, they would say, put out the article for you know, the Rattan Furniture because they would sell thousands on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, but I had an interesting debate with them. I, I wanted to put out an article which was about pee and poo in the garden because I had taken part in a, um, in a study with a university in London about how allotment sites have compost toilets and what happens to the pee and the poo and everything. So I put this uh, article uh, suggestion forward and they were like, no, this is the Daily Mail. We don't do things, you know, that's a bit too, you're pushing it a bit too far now. So I waited until my boss went on holiday and I published it. And it turned out to be the most read gardening article that they'd ever put out. So every time, like during August bank holiday, when not a lot of people are tuned into the website, they were like, right, put that P and Poo article back out again because that'll get the viewers in. Um, I'll, I'll see if I could find, because I took part in the, this study and it's very interesting about how they want to try and create houses in 20 years time that have toilets that are organic toilets rather than being linked up to the main system. So they want to try and encourage people to, um, what's the word, recycle their own human waste. And uh, it's very good for um, pumpkins, apparently. I've used pea in the garden because cabbages, they like pea. But I was a bit put off by using the poo because you didn't know, because it was an allotment site, so you didn't know who was going there. And what was quite surprising is when we started the compost toilet, nobody wanted the pea and poo. But the time we had the results back to say that our pea and poo was the best in the whole of Fuhr Greater London, when, well, everybody wanted it because it was basically a, a wheelie bin full. We filled the wheelie bin up. Then you put the wheelie bin into the sun for six months for it to cook. And then you can put it on your compost. And so many people wanted it we, we, that we actually had um, a raffle uh, to get rid of it. And the following year, the pumpkins, they were huge. I don't know whether anybody actually tasted them. I think that was taking it a bit too, uh, bit too far but I would definitely sort of do it again and maybe put them on uh, the flowers but not on the vegetables so 
I'm just looking at my list of things. Right, S something that came out during my career at the, da at the Daily Mail was, I was still doing my blogging and vlogging. And I wrote an, a blog post in July because Charlie Dimmock had said on a TV show, she had done a TV series about allotment sites, although the series ended up on Sky somewhere. I think it was only ever shown for once because it wasn't a very good series. But she had said as part of the programme that allotment sites should be cut in half and then cut in half again. And there's always been over the last 10 years, this fear of councils have suddenly realised they can get some money from plots. And there's an allotment site in Greenwich, which is about 20 minutes away from me. And around about this time, they put their allotment rents up from £50 a year to £350 a year. And if you lived outside the borough, I think it was about £500. £500. And one of the and the women and the woman that contacted me, she lived opposite the allotment sites, but technically, because it was outside the borough, she had to pay five hundred pounds, despite the fact that she worked for the borough. So I wrote this blog, saying basically Charlie Dimmock should stick to ponds and keep her nose out of the allotment world, you know, stop coming in and stirring and then just going out again. So I wrote this blog the end of June, didn't think anything of it, went back to my website about 200 people had, had sort of seen it so i thought oh well that's okay and then all, all of a sudden i get a phone call from itn saying we're doing an item based on the fact that you've criticized charlie dimmock i was a bit like okay well, i'm a bit surprised and then the guardian contacted me the sun contacted me Newsnight contacted me. They all wanted to do this story of the, about the fact that I had told Charlie Dimmock to go and stick her head in a pond and keep her nose out of the uh, and keep her nose out of our world. And even when I went downstairs in the Daily Mail one day, I had a bit of a shock when I opened the newspaper and saw on page six that I was on there, and this story had been blown out of all proportion. Although the reporter at the Daily Mail did have a surprise when I walked across the office and th threw the newspaper down on his desk going, um, according to the newspaper, you couldn't get hold of me to get a quote. Well, I'm only sat about six desks away from you. Um, so that was a good insight in how newspapers don't actually bother to um, uh, do a story properly, but they just regurgitate what they've seen in a regional paper. So I had this phone call from ITN and I said, oh, I'm not really interested. You know, the story's it's gone on for six days now. It needs to come to, you know, um, an end. And they said, that's fine. We'll just say that we couldn't get hold. We just couldn't, we just couldn't get hold of you. So I decided to go ahead and do the interview. And I'm literally on screen for about six seconds. And that's the next video that we're going to see now. So this is what happens when you do a blog. Sometimes it can have a, a, um, a life of its own. And finally, in allotments across Britain, there is a growing row. The TV gardener, Charlie Dimmock, has suggested one way to beat the long waiting lists to get one would be to divide them up, to produce more but smaller plots. But traditionalists think the idea is, or to be frank, a load of manure. Duncan Bolestani has been hearing the views from a lot Watching over these small slices of the good life, there is an enemy even more alarming than bindweed. They are the plot choppers. Those who call for the size of allotments to be halved or even quartered in order to meet demand. For some allotment holders, they are an irritation which no pellets or spray can get rid of. If you start demanding that uh, plots are scaled down, then you're not going to grow anything more than a row of beans. Like, it's quite hard to believe, but people are still reliant on the allotment plot to feed the family. The history of British allotments is long and proud. In winter, supplies of fresh vegetables are short. With rationing during the Second World War, their popularity grew. Before that, the Victorians gave land over so the poor could feed themselves. So that you can have fresh vegetables in your garden next winter and all year round. This is actually a full plot. And which is enough for me to grow practically 
to everything, as you can see, flowers. The average allotment is 250 square metres. That was thought to be the size needed to feed a family of four. But many influential gardeners now say big isn't necessarily best. There is, in some parts of the country, a 40-year waiting list for allotments. Now, that's crazy. So if people weren't using all of their plots, what's the harm in making some allotments smaller by half or by a quarter and letting a lot more people have a go at gardening? This one is called Mungra. So this is Mungra. Mungra. Can I try? Yeah, yes, you can try. Yeah. Yeah. You can eat like this. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's better cooked, yeah? yeah. yeah. <laughs> Allotment use is changing. Jaswinda and her husband only wanted a half plot, and they still have the space to grow everything they need. The important thing allotment holders say is choice. To dig in, grow, and have a plot to call your own. Duncan Gorostani, ITV News. And that is tonight's ITV News at 10. So it's surprising what can happen if you just do a blog, and then about... Well, I found out during this process that if you ever want to have publicity for a book or for anything, criticise somebody during the second and third week in July. Because there's no politics in September, the press are desperate for a story, so they'll pick up on something which they wouldn't normally be interested in. And if you keep that in mind, next year you'll see certain celebrities will deliberately say things in order to get their book into the newspapers. But about six months after that, I went to, because like I said, I've I've gone into TV for a few months, then I've gone and done something else. So a few months later, I went for a job interview with the BBC. And they said, oh, we're putting this TV show together with the Rich Brothers. Now, I, I had interviewed the Rich Brothers about four years ago. And uh, they said, oh, it's, um, it's this TV show where they're going to do gardens. It's a bit like changing rooms, but better. Um, not changing rooms, uh, ground force. So I said, oh, who's the main presenter? And they said, oh, Charlie Dimmock. And I said, oh, I, well, I know Charlie. And I said, what made you think about her in particular? And they said, well, when we were doing the casting uh, back in August, she was in the newspapers nearly every day. So I have said to Charlie that she owes me some commission for getting her a, t for getting her a TV s a a series. Um, but yeah, every time I turn up and uh, I see her, she tends to, because uh, apparently she went into hiding and she didn't appreciate all the added pressure of, uh, of sort of, of sort of you know, the press. But she got a TV series out of it anyway. So, uh, you know, it isn't all that bad. And just talking about the Rich Brothers there, I was talking to somebody from Gardener's World and I came very, and I became very suspicious how everybody that I filmed in my videos the next year appeared on Gardener's World. So I happened to mention this to somebody and she said, well, I shouldn't tell you, but I'm a production assistant and we watch your videos on a Monday as part of the research process. So when Gardener's World approached me in February of this year, I thought to myself, right, this is my big chance to be on TV because that's one of my ambitions to come to Gardener's World. Because of the lockdown, they had, had approached three vloggers to film items in their garden and we were going to send them in and that was going to make up you know, the show. But because the BBC being the BBC, they have to um, be above, sort of, you know, they have to follow the rules exactly. So for the first few weeks, not even TV crews were allowed into, into Monty's garden. So he filmed himself. So I had an email saying, and the th two other bloggers did as well. They got exactly the same email that I got. And they said, thanks for the video, but it's a bit too professional for what we want. So we aren't going to take this forward. So I've got that on my CV now, too professional for Gardner's World. Um, and it, it's come back to me that because Monty was filming himself, if they put his stuff up against our stuff, his stuff wouldn't have, wouldn't have looked as good. And that section has now developed into people sending in their videos on the mobile phones. So what they were basically trying to find was um, like somebody going in the garden and just filming on their phone with a bit of shake, with a bit of shaky cam. I've just realized that in that ITN 
video that you saw. I've actually got the same top one. I have certain clothes that I wear for gardening, filming. That's why you see it. The, the same clothes in every video because I try and stand by the motto that the that the the plants of the stars of the show are not the presenters and I don't want people sort of talking uh, talking about the clothes no, that I've got on. Um, so at the height of all this, at, at sort of all this tension and everything, I then decided to give my plot up, which I still not I'm still not sure why I did it, but the one of the reasons is when you become popular and you go off and you do all the shows. So I was doing Chelsea Flower Show, Hampton, Hampton Court. The last thing you have time for is to do your own garden. That's what that, that's why people like uh, Monty Don and and Adam Frost. Uh, that's why they garden in their own garden, because if they didn't, they just wouldn't have time to do their own garden. And there are quite a few very popular TV gardeners, where if you went to go and look at their garden, you wouldn't take any information off them whatsoever. And in fact, there's one gardener that doesn't even have a garden at all, even though he pretends to. Um, so I decided to give my plot up. And then about a, a year later, I went back to it. And now my plot is about two and a half, uh, two and a half, uh, what's the word? It's bigger than the plot that I had. So I'm starting again, and that raises an opportunity to film uh, certain aspects of taking a plot on and doing it. But one of the big things that have changed that I've noticed is I interviewed this guy about 12 years ago, and he said, oh, I'm trying to do this new method of doing gardening, but I'm finding it very difficult to get through to the public. So can I come on the video? So I went down to film him and he explained to me this new method of doing gardening, which sounded a bit too good to be true. And that guy then turned into be you know, Charles Dowding. And everybody is doing his method now. And it's very difficult to find anybody on an allotment site that is doing it in the you know, traditional ways. So that's pushed me backwards in the sense of I'm doing sections of my garden in the traditional way so that it doesn't so that that information doesn't disappear into you know uh, sort of throughout the history books then so I'm trying you know, to record it because one of the TV series that I have a fixation on is the Victorian Kitchen Garden which was out in the 80s with Harry Dodson and you know, Ruth Mott and uh, a little side story Harry died, Harry Dodson died 15 years ago, but I went to his funeral two years ago. They discovered by accident that when Harry died, they had put his ashes up on the shelf because his wife was sort of, she was presumed that she was going to die six months later, and she did. But everybody forgot that Harry Dodson was on this shelf and he'd sat on this shelf for 12 years. So we had the funeral about two years ago and I was invited down to the funeral. And I did some, in fact, there's a video on my channel of Harry's funeral. And um, I had a call last week, last week, in fact, from a TV producer who's interested in bringing uh, the old series back. And I think there's a possibility that the series could be repeated on Netflix in about six months time with some new interviews with some of the cast and crew that were, um, that took part in the original uh, series. So I'm just watching the time because uh, it's coming up to, was it 45 minutes you said? So, so being a vlogger is fun. You go through your fun moments, but there can also be a dark side. I, I've had three stalkers in my life. One of them turned up at my front door. Another one keeps sending me pictures of his automatic guns that he has in America. Um, so if I was ever to visit the States, I think I would have to say, I think I'd have to go and come back before I said that I was going to go there just to be on the safe side. Because the internet, if you, if you upset people by not responding to their comments as quickly, in fact, it's quite funny. People will send me an email asking me for some advice. And if I don't see it for three days, they get upset 
And sometimes I've got to go into Google to find out what the answer is, especially if it's anything to do with flowers, because I'm more into your you know, fruit and um, your fruit and your vegetables. Uh, so even though being a vlogger is all fun, there is a dark side to it. So, so if, if anybody's thinking about getting into this, basically do your do your video, do your, your blog or whatever it is, and then switch the computer off and then go and have a life outside. It's too easy to get him to get pulled into the circle of that the most important thing is the stuff that you see on the internet. Um, and I think the lockdown has sort of enhanced that a bit. There's a lot of people in sort of uh, these echo chambers and uh, they aren't talking to people. Anyway, we're going off on a different subject there. But um, outside of the gardening, because I've been doing gardening now for, for about 12 years on the internet, it's not that I'm getting bored with it, but there's only certain ways you can tell people how to plant a, plant a daffodil bulb. I've been doing that for the last 12 years now. And because people don't bother to go back and search through videos you've done in the past. So in order to keep my interest up, I have set up a, another channel where I've discovered that there is a, uh, a walk ar around London. It's 150 miles and you start in Erith and you go all the way around and it takes you through the countryside. And it's been fascinating to see what's out, what is in London, which isn't uh, the big buildings with all, you know, um, you know, the busyness of it all. Although at the moment, central London and especially the city is absolutely dead. And I plan to go in this week to make, uh, to make a video to show how dead it is. But one of the reasons why I'm walking around uh, you know, the woodland is lockdown has helped me become a bit more clear about my future. And one of the things I want is to find somewhere where I can just set up a house or um, a cabin, but do it in the woods and grow my own veg, maybe get a few chickens and pigs and uh, to film all that entire process. Because um, there's a lot of interest at the moment in growing your own veg and through gardening. And when lockdown happened, uh, seeds sales went through the roof. And I know that I've already been told this year that everybody needs to get their seeds in sooner, well, their seed orders in sooner than later, because uh, they expect um, there to be a shortage by the spring. And I know when I ordered my garlic out of a choice of about 20 varieties, there was only the one no, variety there because they're just selling out. So if you haven't put your orders in yet, tr try and get them in this side of uh, Christmas, especially with potatoes. Apparently there's talk that potatoes, there's going to be a shortage of them next spring. So get your orders in sooner than later. Um, so I'm just trying to think. Oh yeah, let's play the video. Let's have a look at my audition for Gardener's World, the one that was a bit too professional. Let's have a look at that one. Hello, I'm Sean James Cameron. Welcome to my garden here in South East London. Now I've been gardening since the age of about 14 and it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, it can be quite disheartening if you've put seedlings into the garden, come back a few days later and they've been destroyed by slugs and snails. Well, I've got some hints and tips on how to stop that. When I first started in gardening we used to put slug pellets out but we're a lot more educated these days and we do it organically and you can get organic versions of slug pellets but you do need to reapply them after a shower of rain but I prefer to go for a totally organic way. One of the best solutions I use is beer. Now you can use just a base of a garden pot, a tray, but if you want to stay organic then have a look in the fridge for a milk bottle and just take the bottom off like so and then put your beer in there. Slugs and snails will fall into that 
and they'll have a nice happy death. But one of the problems with doing it that way is that other insects that you might not want to get rid of could fall in. And this is where one of these devices comes into play. You can put the beer in the bottom, put the top on and the slugs and snails will go underneath and fall into it that way. And one of the advantages, the major advantages of doing it in one of these containers is the fact that when it rains it doesn't wash the beer out. When you do come to empty them stand back because they do really really smell. Another way is eggshells and when you apply the eggshells make sure to completely surround the plant that you're trying to protect because if there's a gap then the pests will get in and they'll have a right field day. So go around the plant and just make sure that it's completely covered. If you are going to use slug pellets then scatter them around the plant rather than putting them in a big pile. They'll have far more use if you just freely scatter them around. For me, my favourite method is the eggshells. I eat them in the house and otherwise they would just go in the bin, so it's a great way of recycling them. But whichever method you use, just take some minutes out and enjoy the garden, maybe with a nice hot cup of tea. On my YouTube channel, I do uh, a few strands of videos. So I have the videos where I show you what I'm up to, and then through that you get hints, you get some hints and tips. But I also do a video called Raw Footage, where I can set a camera up in the corner. And if I'm digging or I'm putting some seeds in, I'll film and I'll put the whole 30 minutes up onto the internet. The, uh, like people like the BBC call this slow TV now. And um, it's interesting the feedback that I've got from that because I do it as a way of just storing the video online that I can get it down in six months when I need it for something else. But the amount of comments that I've had back from people who tell me things like uh, that their husband died and for the last six months they haven't been outside and that watching those type of videos have got them back into gardening. Because I think these days... Everything's a bit too fast because if you watch things, things like Gardener's World and like Coronation Street, you can count that the scenes will only last about twelve seconds, and then they're onto some, and then they're onto, they're onto something else. So in the videos that I do, I try and also orchestrate the silence and where you just listen to the birds. Um, but if you want to go and find out more about that, just go over to my blog, which is Sean's. Al seansallotmangarden.com with the Sean spelled S-E-A-N. I can't think of anything else to say, so I will now hand back. Thank you very much, Sean. Does anyone have any um, questions that I'd like to ask Sean? TV or allotment related? I have, please. Just before you started talking about your interest in the Victorian kitchen garden programs, which I remember, um, you mentioned a new way of gardening that everybody does. Uh, what is it? Oh, well, back in back in the day, it was um, the no dig method. Oh, where, right. OK, thank where you. Where you don't dig. Um, yeah. And he just couldn't get it through to people that he said there was a big issue with people that if you're on an allotment site and 80 people are doing it the old-fashioned way nobody wants to be the odd one out which is quite <laughs> interesting now because more people do the no dig than do the old-fashioned way so things have completely changed in the 10 years even since i've been filming it 
So who knows where we'll be in 10 years' time. We'll be sat here talking about how I've had a fantastic crop of pineapples. Okay, thank you. Because the weather is certainly, well, in London, we usually have four months of solid sunshine every year at the moment, and then we go into drought. It's the same here. <laughs> Thanks. What's about the um, gardening by moonlight? That is something that I'm doing this year. And I want to do it for another year before I bring my videos out because I don't want it to start saying things if it was just a complete fluke for this year but I have noticed that uh, my potatoes have been bigger uh, this year with the ones that I've planted in accordance to the uh, with the phases of the moon and in fact on my blog I'm putting up a, a an article on the weekend which is just talking about the basics about how you've got to plant uh, two days before the full moon and it goes into great detail about uh, when the best time to harvest but it's not really gardening by the moon I'm trying to think of an, another way to try and rebrand it all because when you say gardening by the moon people seem to think it's all to do with the light that's coming off the moon which is oh, right. nothing to do with that it's all about the water table and about how uh, the water table changes with the phases of through the moon. So I'm trying to think of a new way to make it, to rebrand it, to be a bit more easier for people to understand. Because I had somebody do a video, a full 30 minute video explaining why garden, gardening from the moon, it wasn't gonna work. And he based it all on the sunlight, which has got nothing to do with that. It's all about the water table. Um, so yeah, I want to do it for another, year just to make sure that what happened this year just wasn't uh, you know uh, something that's done to the weather yeah so check my blog out on the weekend and there'll be a full article on there going okay. into far more detail about um i'll say if you do garden by the moon you're very busy in the first two and a half weeks of every month at the start of every month and then towards the end of the two and a half, and then towards the rest of the month you can really just sit down and enjoy it because there's not a because there's not a lot to do. You're busy at the start at the start of the month rather than at the end. So it's a good way of being really planned because you have to sit down and do like a plan of right. I want to prune this tree, uh, but I can't do that for two for two and a half weeks because because I've got to wait for the right moment for when the water table is going down. Um, so check out my blog uh, in a few days and then you'll see everything on there. Okay. Thank you. But your what were your preliminary results that you had? Was it that you had du you doubled the harvest, like for like? Everything was bigger. Right. All right. And I did it this year with uh, potatoes, and I, and everything that I'd planted at the right time was bigger, tasted better, and everything that I put at the wrong time um, were smaller and wasn't well it was the type of potatoes that by the time you take the skin off there isn't a lot of potato left right okay fascinating i think it's going to be the next big well i'm trying to make it the next big thing and <laughs> anyway yeah i feel inclined to try it and do a 50 percent of regular planting and 50 percent going by that um, theory. Well, I have a video on my channel. I can't remember what it's called now, but I interviewed a scientist from Greenwich University and they said they had no information on that in particular, but they did have information about the water table and the, therefore she could see there could be a link. But um, the RHS did it. Did, um, a trial about seven years ago but I don't know where the results have gone oh. um, they sort of did it and I think it's what I think it's one of these things of they did it but they don't want to be seen to be wasting their money on you know, kooky ideas so maybe right. they're just waiting for somebody else to come out first and then they'll uh... in fact I'll said in fact I know the curator of um, 
uh, the Wisley Garden. So, so I will send them an email as, um, after and find out what happened. And it'd be really good if they did. And I think Kew Gardens did something as well. Yeah, mm. I'll do a bit more digging on that. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Sean? Sean, could I ask, please, if you have any top tips for keeping weeds off your vegetables? Um, no, because I haven't got a problem to do with weeds. Oh. <laughs> In fact, if you watch my videos, every month I do a, I do a tour of my plot. And it's the most disliked video that I put out because I think people are looking for a for uh, a pristine garden and I haven't got well to me a weed is just a plant that's growing in with the wrong place I'm far more concerned about the fact we, that the foxes are pulling up my cabbages and um, only this week we've discovered that um, even in my area in Crystal Palace the badgers have have appeared in the last week and they've started to destroy everything that they've seen um, so I, I haven't got an issue to do with weeds except just just every time you go out there just um sort of just do uh, five minutes of uh, pulling them up because uh, i try to do everything in an in an organic way which is interesting in itself because when when i started back in the 90s you were taught just to cake everything in every chemical that you could find uh, but learn to live with the weeds <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll discover in a few years time that there'll be the cure for something. Yeah. Well, in fact, I mean... somebody took somebody took in an allotment plot on our site about a year ago, and they said, "Look, look, we don't want to. You've got a choice of two plots. You can either have this one that's that'll take you about two weeks and you get it done, or there's this one that's got bindweed." Um, oh, what's that one that comes up through the concrete? Um, James Wong did an article to say that we shouldn't uh, pull it up. What's uh, Japanese, Japanese knotweed? Yes, yes. And she took that plot on because she runs a restaurant in central London where they serve Japanese knotweed instead of rhubarb. And they use bindweed in their in their um, in well, their cocktails, and they use a mare's tail to garnish things. And she uh, and she asked if we wanted to go to the restaurant, but we've all been really busy since she asked because <laughs> nobody wants to go and uh, try it. Um, so it's very interesting that she's actively trying to encourage all these weeds. Any more questions? No. Okay. Well, enormous thanks, Sean, for your time that's a, that's and fine. your stories. Lots of fascinating nuggets. And we haven't even got into the area of when I worked in the West End with Judy Dench, but we'll keep that for another oh one. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. You'll be back then. <laughs> I went... I went through this period of filming people and then they would die within a year. So I interviewed Eartha Kitt and she died within a year. I interviewed um, Harold Pinter and in fact he died the day before Eartha Kitt died. So I became very popular in the West End. That's it. Unfortunate. Well, but, but like, we'll keep that for another day. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I'll share uh, links to your okay. blogs and blogs um, to everybody after this. Okay, um, thanks. So people can sign up and um, look at your videos at their leisure. Okay, thank you. Sean, Lovely. thank you very much. Of Monty Don. Pardon? Your picture, is it a picture of you in Monty Don? Oh, it, yes, yeah, you can flash that up if you want to. It was, um, this was just what you were there. So, uh, what we used to do was, uh, this was one of the supplements that were in the paper of um, 
or through other columns like that we used to do. So I used to do the I used to do the gardening, uh, the growing your veg section, and then Monty ended up doing um, talking about why he loves slugs and snails and uh, foxes in his garden. And I'll have to have a word with him to see if he's to see if he wants a few badgers. And I'll pop <laughs> them in the post to him. <laughs> Because we're not enjoying the badgers being on the site at the moment. No. But at least we've only got one. We're sort of dreading if we find two of them because they because they tell me that within a year they'll be all over the place. Mm. Not good. Okay. On that note, thank you, thank you very much, everybody, and Sean in particular. Oh, I just couldn't. Hear, I couldn't hear you then, and th then I realised I put it onto mute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I said thank you very much for everybody okay, and um and in particular you Sean. Thanks. Huge thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Take care everybody. Cheerio. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.